Um, welcome, everyone. I'm Catherine Frankie. Um, I direct our Palestine and Law program here at the law school, and I'm part of the um, collective that uh, governs the Center for Palestine Studies, and we are delighted, delighted that we're joined this afternoon by Professor Noura Arakat and Diala Shamas for a conversation about Professor Arakat's new magnificent book, Justice for Some, Law and the Question of Palestine. Um, let's just do this. <laughs> uh, for the book and for Professor Arakat and, and for the question of Palestine, I would say. Um, you know, I've, I've written a couple of books. Many of you in the room have written books. The birth of a book is a magnificent event. Um, uh, it's, sometimes we're tired of the topic by the time the book comes in print, but it's such a timely timely publication, and I'm just so delighted to have this conversation today. Um, and books will be for sale, oh, are for sale, but don't leave now. In the, out in the hall, there's a table where um, books, you can purchase books, and I believe Professor Erica will sign them. Yes, afterwards, um, so please pick one up. Um, she is an assistant professor at Rutgers, New Brunswick, in the Department of Africana Studies and in the program in Criminal Justice. We're delighted to have her up north near us, nearer to us. Uh, she's also the co-founding editor of Jadalia. If you read um, online um, e-magazines, it is an incredibly important source um, for both activists and scholars writing on the Middle East. Um, Diala Shamas, to my right, your left, is a staff attorney at the Center for Constitutional Rights based here in New York City. Um, at CCR, she works on challenging government uh, and law enforcement abuses perpetrated under the guise of national security and safety, both in the United States and abroad, um, with a particular focus uh, on uh, Palestinian rights in the Middle East. Um, about a few words about the book. Um, for seasoned experts, of which many of you are, and for others who were new, to the issue of Palestinian self-determination, which I'm hoping is true for some of you in the room. Um, Justice for Some offers a comprehensive and forceful rendering of the role of the law in the creation and fortification of the state of Israel and the struggle for Palestinian freedom. The argument of the book is carefully grounded in history and in legal documents while offering a persuasive critique of the limits and the possibilities of national freedom operationalized through the use of international law. As Ericot argues in the book, political Zionism has made effective strategic use of law as a method of governance over Palestinians, what she terms a non-juridical people. The strategic deployment of law by Israel's founders and defenders, a kind of lawfare in the larger project of statecraft has effectively advanced the settler colonial ambitions of Zionism and consolidated the gains made in the name of that larger political project. So too, the book shows how lawfare can be a tool of less powerful actors, illustrating how Palestinians have exploited fissures, creases, and handholds even in international law to advance the cause of Palestinian self-determination. In this sense, justice for some carries no brief for the integrity or virtue of international law, but rather exposes its amenability to opportunistic use by political and social movements across the political spectrum and across the globe. The elegant and at times, I would say, devastating truth of Ericot's argument reminds me of the work of our former colleague here at Columbia Law School, Robert Cover. In 1986, he published a just phenomenal article in the Yale Law Journal entitled, Violence and the Word. He opened the article with one of the most devastating indictments of the power of law that I think has ever been written. He wrote, legal interpretation takes place in a field of pain and death. I teach covers article in my classes in the law school, a kind of um, uh, treason really for law professors to teach the idea 
that legal interpretation takes place on a field of, of pain and death. And I will now teach justice for some as a tremendous example <laughs> of that larger idea. Um, the book uh, provides, I just think, as I said, this amazing example that illuminates the truth of Cover's observation about the role and the power of law to bring into being and to extinguish social worlds. Thank you for this book. Thank you for joining us today. Professor Ericott will speak first about the book, and then she'll be followed by comments from Diala Shamas. Then we'll open up for your questions. And again, I'll note the book is for sale in the back. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that very generous introduction. And I love that you're invoking uh, Cover's work here and the work and the, and the concept of law as violence and legal violence. Um, quick confession, this is my first time at Columbia Law School, which is kind of crazy. And I was just looking around, I was like, oh, look at how fancy. I went to Berkeley, so we had a nicer view. Anyway, uh, <laughs> um, I also just want to say how really amazing it is right now. There's a kind of uh, a warmth just getting where I can look at the audience and I recognize so many of you and uh, people that I've grown with, people that I've organized with, people that I've danced with, <laughs> um, people that have taught me um, and um, continue to teach me and that I've struggled with. Most of you I've, I've, I've struggled with in the trenches and so it's no, and some of you have been in my class. So <laughs> nice to see you here. This is just such a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. Thank you for um, having me. Um, let me uh, share a little bit. You know, there, there's something crazy about writing a book on Palestine, especially 100 years out where everybody, you know, Everybody thinks it's the most simple thing right now in the Middle East, given the context in Syria, in Yemen, in Egypt, now in Lebanon, um, and beyond. Now, every, you know, Palestine seems to be that easy one that we can understand. Everyone, you know, has written about it and read about it, so why would you do this, right? Um, and I have to admit that it wasn't necessarily a choice to write this book as much as it was a compulsion. I felt like I had no other choice. If I had I been more strategic, it wouldn't have been the first book that I put out in the world. But it was coming through me, and I, and I had to share because it was born of particular experiences that actually begin at law school. So I was um, a student activist at UC Berkeley, where we launched the first divestment campaign before there was BDS in 2005, when on the first, um, the second time that Ariel Sharon was elected into um, office on February 6, 2001, Students at Berkeley unfurled a banner that said, divest from apartheid Israel. And basically um, set, and set off a bit of a firestorm across the country where other students were doing the same. We then took over buildings. We built a refugee camp on campus. We blocked the you know, entrance to Highway 580. I mean, we were, we were being good student activists. And at the time, I was extremely frustrated by our lack of efficacy because we hadn't divested a single, single dollar. We were in the height of the second Palestinian intifada. We couldn't save or prevent a single life. And it was that frustration combined with um, a very youthful naivety and ignorance and arrogance <laughs> that led me to think, OK, this activism is not going to do it. I have to go to law school because that's going to do it. And I'll just do it better, but better than it's been done before. And surely all we need to do is get in front of an audience, a judge will just share the facts, the law is on our side, we'll argue it well, and Palestine will be free. That was a horrible decision. <laughs> no, it wasn't a horrible decision, but it was very poor judgment to think that was. And coming to law school was horrifying. As any, you know, recovering jurist will tell you, it's a little bit traumatizing coming back into law school. For the law students in the room, you're going to be fine. <laughs> okay? Um, but I, 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 you know, I, I went to law school really hoping to find a bunch of Thurgood Marshalls and Ruth Bader Ginsburgs, and I looked around and I was like, I am surrounded by the smartest, most committed, 
hardest working young minds in this country, and they all are trying to get rich really fast. <laughs> Nobody's trying to save anything, okay? Um, somehow I survived, but in the course of that, there was, there was still this compulsion. I wanted to use the law. The whole reason I went to law school is because I was going to sue Israeli generals. That was the whole point. But when I graduated in 2005, there's really no such thing in the United States as Palestinian human rights. There's counterterrorism, so I can work on a, 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 through a national security framework, and there's peace and conflict studies. So there's parity, we need dialogue, we need to get people to understand one another and to come to a particular outcome. But to say Palestinian human rights was a bit blasphemous, right? Because already you're suggesting that somebody's violating them, which as, you still, as we still know, can be tricky and sensitive and oftentimes controversial at a time where even saying that I was Palestinian, I had students complaining to the administration that I would identify as Palestinian. Again, I went to Berkeley, so it's not, you know, but I guess that doesn't make sense for people who aren't there. Um, but I graduate law school, I create my own position. I get a fellowship, create my own position to work with the U.S. campaign for Palestinian, um, it wasn't Palestinian rights then, it was the Palestinian uh, U.S. campaign to end the Israeli occupation. Their name now is much better. Um, but I, cre I, I create from scratch a position to basically seed BDS campaigns across the country in 2005 and to sue Israeli generals. I'm still on it. And in, in that year, within a year, we get that opportunity. So together with the Center for Constitutional Rights, that Diala is now with, with the attorneys there, as well as a number of cooperating attorneys, I see Jamil Dakwar in the room, we brought two lawsuits, one against Avi Dichter for the raising of 5,000 homes in Rafah, in the south of Gaza in 2005, in the southern district of New York, and one against Moshe Alon who was responsible for the bombing of a UNIFIL compound in the south of Lebanon in Qana in 1996 in the D.C. District Court. So now I'm about to vindicate all the hard work in the survival at law school. And within less than a year of filing those claims, both lawsuits were dismissed on grounds of non-justiciability, which means that they were never heard on their merits. The survivors never got to say their stories even. And instead, we, the, the court, each court told us, on, one court said that this was a violation of the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, which prohibits anybody from suing a foreign state in a U.S. federal court. There is an exception, of course. It's the Flatow Amendment, which says that you can bring a lawsuit against those states that Department of State has designated as state sponsors of terror. Israel is not on that list. So this, is, this was tantamount to suing Israel, and so it was dismissed. The other case was dismissed because it was said that it raised a political question. A political question, the political question doctrine for folks who are studying constitutional law, tells us that if a question is better suited for another branch of government, specifically the legislature or the executive, then the judiciary does not have jurisdiction to answer it. And for them, this was Palestine, Israel is a political question that they shouldn't touch, and that was dismissed. So at the time, Susan Akram, who is a professor at Boston University and supervising me, instructs me to not give up and to continue the strategic litigation research. And I have to look for other venues now and go from the D.C. district and the southern district here on the east coast. And I should go west where a panel might be more favorable. And in the course of that strategic litigation research, I found something really interesting, which is that if you have the same fact patterns or very similar fact patterns, in cases involving Chinese, Paraguayan, Filipino, Guatemalan, Papuan, Serbian, Filipino, did I say Filipino? Officials, okay, the list is, is tremendous. They, they withstood scrutiny and were justiciable. And so I controlled for the identity of the claimant and the defendant and was able to show that when Arabs sue Israelis in U.S. federal courts, there is bias. And that was my first law review article. Now, mind you, I'm not convinced that I should go into the academy just yet. I still want to fight. But I'm, 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 I'm struck by what's going on between law and politics that's producing this outcome and that's making the law ineffective. And so I continue to try to fight. 
I work on the Hill as legal counsel. I joined the National Lawyers Guild on a fact-finding mission to Gaza in 2009 with Radhika Seinath, who's here from Palestine Legal. I also then work for Badil, at the Badil uh, Resource Center for Palestinian Refugee and Residency Rights, and represent them at the UN in Geneva, in New York, in Washington. We're trying. I, I'm trying everything in order to, to use the law to advance the Palestinian struggle for freedom. And at every turn, I'm finding the same formidable obstacle that's presented by politics. And that question of what is the relationship between international law and politics, and what does it tell us about the Palestinian struggle for freedom, becomes so overwhelming as to drive me back to school and as to sustain me and culminates in justice for some. Um, so let me answer the, how I answer those questions in brief for you and then tell you a little bit more about the book. I, in answering the question about the relationship between law and politics, I'm drawing on a literature of critical legal studies about the entwinement of the law and politics, that they're inextricable. And I argue that the law is politics, and in order to leverage its emancipatory function or, or potential, it must be leveraged in the sophisticated service of a political movement. Okay, this is a very, this, you know, theory is very much a movement lawyer theory, that it'll be the movements that drive the law, and not the law that provides any kind of moral or political compass. It should not, because the law is indeterminate and is susceptible to what Duncan Kennedy describes as legal work or the work that advocates do in order to change its meaning in order to achieve a particular outcome. For some people in here who have a fidelity to law that sounds really blasphemous, how can you say that? The law is noble, the law, and right? When we want to say, you know, we want to achieve something that's akin to international law and human rights, we're obviously, in, you know, it's a normative suggestion, suggestion of something good. So when I say that the law is indeterminate and doesn't offer that, and doesn't offer that meaning, that's where there's, uh, you know, that's where we get into the tension of this. And there's a number of schools that have tried to unpack what this means. The realists would argue that yes, the law is politics, and go so far as to say that the law is a political fiction. In the words of Richard Falk, it is a political fiction used as a club to bludgeon for the strong to bludgeon the weak, right? But even my research, accepting that argument that might makes right, doesn't make sense against the research, which showed that weaker parties have often used the law to advance their cause. In fact, Palestinians, in, being confront, in confronting Israel, the only nuclear power in the Middle East and the 11th most uh, significant military power in the world, the U.S.'s self-described most unique ally in the Middle East, the stateless Palestinians were able to use the law to affirm their status as a juridical people in 1974 in UN General Assembly Resolutions 3236 and 3237. They were able in 1975 to establish that Zionism is a form of racism and a form of racial discrimination that is akin to apartheid. They were able in 1977 to establish, along with the non-aligned movement and the G77 and the rest of the third world, to establish that guerrillas are not criminal terrorists, but they are soldiers who can be legally regulated by the law under the first and second additional protocols. So clearly, just the, uh, the em em empirical evidence demonstrates that we cannot accept this fatalist outcome and conclusion. But on the other hand, there's this argument, and these are the positivists, and this is where I begin as an attorney, right, and as a young law student, that believe that the law does have a meaning that it could be studied on its own, that somehow it offers some you know, virtue and value, and yet that also can't withstand scrutiny based on my experience alone as an advocate. Because that's not what happens. And if you don't have that experience and need it, you can also think about all the General Assembly resolutions that have not been implemented, right? So I come somewhere, I'm not a positivist, but I'm also not a realist, and there's seats in the front for folks in the back. Um, <laughs> I, I'm not a re and there's seats right there and, and some here. Um, because, because I am an activist. And as an activist, I have um, an undying optimism that another world is possible. 
right? That is what is driving this. Uh, and so I come somewhere, not in the middle, but somewhere over here, just to the left of the realists, to say, okay, the law is politics, but that, doesn't, that also doesn't determine an outcome, right? What determines the outcome is legal work, a balance of power, the historical context, strategy, right? So the analogy that I offer is think of the law like the sail of a boat. A boat is not going to move without a sail, but a sail alone will not determine direction. That direction is determined by politics, which is the wind. So put up the sail when useful, draw the sail when harmful, and create a new sail when possible. Right? And that is distinct from the realist position because the realist would offer you the analogy that the boat is being operated by a motor, an invisible motor at the bottom of the boat that moves it and drives it, right? So that would be the distinction because it could seem slight. All right, so that's how I answer the first question. What about the second? What does it tell us about the Palestinian struggle for freedom? And here, so if the first question is answering, there's two parts of the law. One is about the content of the law, which is why there is no core meaning, and I'm saying it's indeterminate, and it could be susceptible to legal work. The other part of the law is about the form, or the structure. And the international structure is one in which that has given rise to the question, is there such a thing of international law? If it can't be implemented, there's no international police, there is no, the law clearly does not have the capacity either to command state behavior nor to punish state transgressions. So that's the structural question. And how do we answer that question, especially because of the relative weak position of the Palestinians? And here, I draw on the work of Professor Rashid Khalidi, um, and starting in 1917 and looking specifically at the Balfour Declaration to describe um, what, what I think is, is part of my offering that basically sustains the rest of the story which is that in 1917, the Balfour Declaration, by designating Palestine to establish a Jewish national home, and mind you, that's distinct from a Jewish state in order to undermine this conspiratorial framework, right? It was a Jewish national home, right? When in, in designating the land for such purpose, it described 90% of the native population as non-Jewish in the negative and guaranteed them only their civil and religious rights, but not their political rights. What I describe as a juridical erasure, because it denied their status as people under international law. And it, peoplehood in international law is tantamount, gives you a tantamount rights to self-determination, which I'll also explain, that was in a given at the beginning. But that's a juridical erasure. And in 1917, that erasure was no more than colonial hubris. But in 1922, when the League of Nations incorporate that text verbatim into the preambular text of the Palestine Mandate, they have now enshrined the colonial erasure as international law and policy. And now Palestinians don't exist as a people, as a matter of international law and policy. So that's not the end of the story, right? But this is what I describe as the sovereign exception. And here again, the sovereign exception is also subject to a tremendous amount of debate whether or not it's a site of lawlessness or a site of lawfulness. And, I'm, and a sovereign exception basically means it's, it's, it's tantamount to declaring a national emergency where you are establishing that there is a political prerogative so tremendous that it justifies the suspension of civil law or of a, a normal application of law. But that doesn't mean the absence of law. What I share that it means is that far from now just giving the sovereign the right to move and do politically whatever they want, instead it translates into law by establishing a sui generis framework. Lawyers, law students, sui generis, yes, means Latin for unlike anything other. If a fact pattern is unlike anything other, it has no precedent and it has no analogy. If it has no precedent and no analogy, there can be no applicable law, and so it gives the sovereign a lawmaking authority to create new law where they're suggesting that no law 
exists. And the declaration of that exception, the erasure of Palestinians as a people in 1922, together with the declaration that Palestine is a sui generis mandate, which is what the League of Nations describe it as, as a sui generis mandate, has provided this unique lawmaking authority to basically allow Israel, as it has, to describe its occupation as sui generis. Therefore, occupation law is not going to apply as a matter of law, but could apply as a matter of fact. It gives it the authority to establish that Gaza is a sui generis framework. It's neither independent nor is it occupied. It's a hostile entity. It gives it the ability to describe its confrontation with Palestinians as sui generis. It's not war. It's not not war. They create a new category of armed conflict short of war in order to create new laws of war that permit them to use greater force and simultaneously incapacitate the Palestinian use of force. All in the language of law. All in the language of law. So how do then, answering the question of then, what, is, what, what then for the Palestinian struggle, is a question of how do you overcome the exception? How do you overcome the exception? And so what I do in the book in narrating 100 years uh, from 1917 to 2017 as a non-historian, I apologize to the historians for the great offense. <laughs> And even the greatest historians wouldn't do 100 years unless you're really senior, like Professor Khaled so again, um, yeah, great offense. Um, it's, uh, anyway, so anyway, um, <laughs> in the course, I'm basically showing how the struggle to over, the, the, the moments that Palestinians have successfully overcome the exception and when the exception has been used in order to devastate Palestinians to advance Israel's political claims very successfully in the language of law. And, and, and I show, and I'll just tell you right now, I show that the times that they've been most successful, they've actually not used legal argumentation because you can't use a legal argument to overcome a sui generis framework when the whole point is that you've been told it's unlike any other. So there is no applicable law. So when Palestinians in the interwar years protest that the League of Nations is violating the mandate because the mandatory power, Britain, is in violation of Article 22 of the League of Nations Charter for not... Uh, for not consulting the local population, the League, the, the, um, the League of Nations responds, that might be true, but for the fact that this is sui generis and in order to establish a Jewish national home, it's necessary in order to not comply with that particular article. So what appears initially as a violation of law now becomes compliance with it within this framework. And the times that Palestinians have been the most successful is not when they've used legal argumentation, it's when they've actually changed the balance of power and challenged the geopolitical structure that sustains this narrative, that sustains the sui generis structure. And the first time that they do that very successfully is during the Great Revolt between 1936 and 1939, which literally, as a result of the strong, what begins as a boycott of British goods and then British taxes and then culminates in an armed revolt and forces uh, British colonial authorities to deploy something like 25,000 troops where Palestinians literally take over control of Jerusalem for something like three days, at the end of which there's so much force that's necessary in order to squash this revolt that 10% of the adult male population is decimated through exile, detention, or murder. Or killing, right? Because to say that it's murder is to say that there's some sort of legal conclusion about culpability, and yes, nerds, we will not have that conversation. Sorry, I was getting down my legal rabbit hole. Okay, moving on. <laughs> the point is that in the course of the Great Revolt, as a result of that showing, Britain actually reverses its policy, issues the white paper to basically say that its Zionist policies were, were wrong, that they would actually stem Jewish immigration, and they would, stem, they would stem land sales. And not only that, but they would revisit legal arguments that had previously enabled them to facilitate the, um, this Zionist settlement. They would revisit those legal arguments to come to different legal conclusions as a result of this confrontation. So the moments when we see Palestinians most successfully 
challenging this, the sui generis framework and their exception is in, the, in actual changing this balance of power. Okay, so that's one of the lessons. What then do I do um, is narrate then 100 years from 1917 to 2017 to tell the story. I do that chronologically uh, against the advice of most legal scholars who wanted to see the book broken down thematically, a chapter on 242, a chapter on laws of war, a chapter on occupation law. I don't do that, and I don't do that for two reasons. One is, it co completely contravenes the first argument that I made, which is that the, the, the law is indeterminate. And I want to show how one law can change meaning across time and space. So for example, take UN Security Council Resolution 242. When it's passed unanimously in 1967, the Palestinians see it as an instrument of defeat. One, it enshrines the juridical erasure of Palestinians by describing them as a refugee problem, not as a people. Two, it also enshrines Israel exi Israel's existence as a political reality because by establishing a quid pro quo arrangement to where Israel gets to retain Arab lands as consideration to be exchanged for permanent peace. So that's going to be an inevitability. Israel's existence is guaranteed and enshrined, and Palestinians are erased. And so for 20 years, Palestinians condemn 242 as an instrument of defeat, as they condemn the Hashemite kingdom and the Zionists and the American imperialists and da 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 da, until 1988, when the Palestinian National Council declares Palestinian independence in the West Bank and Gaza. And now they're drawing on two um, UN resolutions, UN resolution, General Assembly Resolution 181, establishing partition in 1947 that they had opposed since you know, the first iteration of partition, and Resolution 242 to make their claim of self-determination. Now, at that point, what happens, once they begin to use, the Palestinians begin to use 242 as an instrument of resistance, we now see the narrative about 242 shift when, it, when Israel and the United States are discussing it. Now it becomes, well, there's no, and they had always said, there's no definite, the Israeli argument had always been, there's no definite article preceding the word occupation, so it's not clear which lands are to be withdrawn from in exchange for peace. You plausibly, the withdrawal from the Sinai Peninsula of Egypt, which is multiple times the size of the West Bank in Gaza, satisfied its terms, so there's really no obligation now to withdraw from the Golan Heights or the West Bank. Should be very relevant to us now in hearing that, right? But even in the drafting documents of the Declaration of Principles, also known as also in 1993, the only mention of law, all those legal achievements that the PLO um, gain throughout the 1970s, they voluntarily surrender. They rescind the resolution um, condemning Zionism. They denounce uh, and amend their charter so that they no longer can use force, dis despite that right being enshrined in the additional protocols, right? The only law that's mentioned, there's no mention of water law, refugee law, no mention of any laws in the, in the drafting documents, except for 242 and 338. And even when they're mentioned, they're mentioned in their prescriptive nature, not, excuse me, their descriptive nature, not their prescriptive one. So that it won't prescribe an outcome. It'll only instead describe that when the two parties have reached an agreement, they would have successfully satisfied the terms of 242 and 338. Okay. So... That's why, that's one reason I narrate the book chronologically. The other reason is because I, wanna, I want to, for myself, understand the history of the present. I want to understand what, how did we get to this place that we're here right now in Palestine, and what does it tell us about what we need to do to move forward? Um, so chapter one is pretty much the background chapter where I'm spent, it's 50 years spanning 1917 to 1966, the martial law regime that's established over the Palestinians who remain, who become citizens of Israel. Um, and that's really key because there we see the exception est established and placed as a permanent form of racial, uh, racialized governance, which is directly what Cover is telling us about racial domination in the United States, for example, where the exception is permanent. It's a permanent form of racialized governance. 
But that framework, the, martial, the emergency regime, is, it continues in Israel. But the martial law regime was ended in 66, and it's applied to the Palestinians now in the West Bank in Gaza after 1967. Second chapter, 1967 war. Each, by the way, each of the five junctures that I've chosen are junctures that are precipitated by a political confrontation that creates a legal opportunity to then re, to fight over the meaning of law and its application that then changes our diplomatic relationship to the question of Palestine, right? So the first is the First World War, the second is the 1967 war, and there what I show is contrary to what we usually say, especially if you're an ad, I should say not we, we as an advocates uh, for Palestine and Palestinians, Israel is violating international law by expanding and entrenching its settlement enterprise. What I show is that Israel has been able to expand and entrench its settlement enterprise, not in contravention of the law, but because of it. How does it become a tool, an absolutely critical tool, that it needs in order to basically establish the reality that we have today, which is 20 non-contiguous Bantustans in the West Bank, where Area C, 62%, 60 percent of, of the West Bank, is now being laid claim to, right? Chapter three then moves to the 1973 war. Notice that this, this theme of war is really critical um, in terms of creating these legal opportunities. The October 1973 war basically marks the moment when we learn that Egypt and Syria are not going to fight a conventional war of total liberation on behalf of Palestinians. They are going to negotiate. That's the sense that, that we get. It basically precipitates now the Middle East peace process. And under Kissinger's, um, uh, you know, I guess some would call it genius, some would call it evil, but under... Um, um, Kissinger's advice, the Middle East peace process at this point is also disaggregated so that it's no longer an Arab-Israeli peace process. It becomes an Egyptian-Israeli peace process, a Jordanian-Israeli peace process, a Syrian-Israeli peace process, and the Palestinians are left out. They will not be part of the peace process because they haven't recognized 242. That was a condition of, of them entering into the peace process. Um, and what happens then in 1973 uh, onwards is, is this high moment of legal advocacy, but the other thing that I'm exploring is a split within the, Palest the PLO and Palestinian national thinking that creates a, a, and crystallizes a, reject a, a pragmatist front that believes in establishing a Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza as an interim or a final status solution, and a rejectionist front that wants to continue a revolutionary struggle. And that'll be really consequential later, especially in 1987, at the start of what's known as the First Palestinian Intifada, which is the next juncture, and Chapter 4, that basically results in the Declaration of Principles, or Oslo. Now, just a quick word on that chapter. I started wanting to do, just answer as a, as a legal scholar, to, to, to really unpack and show a lay, leader, lay reader why, uh, the, why Oslo is such a bad agreement. That's all I want. I just wanted to explain it to the lay reader. And then the series of documents afterwards that like Oslo II and the White River and so on and so forth. But what I found in the course of that exercise is that you don't need to be a lawyer to be able to explain why it's such a bad agreement. You simply need to be literate. <laughs> <laughs> so the next question I wanted to ask then was why would the PLO enter into this agreement? And how did Israel successfully get them to do it? Right? And to answer those questions, there isn't necessarily an ar a Palestinian archive that tells us that story. And I have to so do what now I, I term as recreate, uh, creating a new Palestinian archive by interviewing the negotiators and the advisors to the negotiators. Again, uh, Professor Khaledi has been instrumental in this process, so I'm just going to keep on <laughs> giving thanks and gratitude. Um, but I do interview him, and I interview Hanan Ashrawi, and Nabil Sha'af, and Kamil Mansour, um, and I draw on the works of Rajesh Hadi, and um, Abu, Abu Ala, and so and the memoirs of Abu Ala. Don't necessarily wish that on anyone, but it's a... <laughs> <laughs> but 
then I, I answer that question. I think I, I think I answer that question. I hope you find that I answer that question. I can't tell you because you still need to get the book. Um, <laughs> And then in the last chapter, that's the chapter that begins at what we term the Al-Aqsa Intifada, or the second Palestinian Intifada, where the, where the peace process collapses after Camp David. And now we see the lightly armed CIA-trained Palestinian security forces turn their light weapons against Israeli forces. And this is the advent. This is when Israel now changes its relationship to Palestinians from a framework of occupation to a framework of all-out warfare. And they do it within the Israeli legal division of the Israeli defense forces, of the Israeli army. That's where this is happening. And those seeds, that legal logic, that argument that they create in order to squash the second Palestinian intifada become the exact legal argument that then justifies full-on warfare in Gaza that we see in large-scale onslaughts between 2009 that continue to the present or I think will continue because this is, we've not resolved it. We've not resolved it. So contrary to, again, what some human rights advocates might say, Israel has gotten away with impunity of killing over 2,000 Palestinians and 534 children in a span of 51 days in 2014. To the contrary, Israeli ethicists and Israeli legal advisors are saying that this is proportionate warfare because they have successfully shrunk who counts as a Palestinian civilian and increased the value of the Israeli soldier in a proportionality assessment. Anyways, again, you'd have to read the chapter to figure that out. I don't end on such a negative note. I actually end because I've already confessed to you I am an undying optimist. That's why we, that's why we struggle. That's why we're here. Um, and I end by, you know, summarizing, talking more about the law for people who are still interested in the law. But throughout the book, there's a tension I'm struggling with. And it's a tension between the literatures I'm drawing from. I'm drawing from a literature on international relations, political science, and legal theory. And simultaneously, I'm drawing on what I would describe as freedom literature. Right? So the black radical tradition, indigenous struggles, feminist theory, right? I'm doing that, I'm doing this work at the same time, and that's why this is such torture to, to deal with. By the end of the book, I end, I resolve that tension by shifting completely, full frontally, to the freedom literature. To the freedom literature. And I do that because. I, at the end of this exercise, was confronted with the three political solutions that have been available to Palestinians since 1947 that the UN Special Committee on Palestine recommended, right? It's, a, it's one state with strong protections for the Jewish minority. It's a binational state or it's a two-state solution. Well, we've known that for a few decades and that hasn't gotten us anywhere. So I didn't want to end there. And by turning to... Um, these other literatures, and specifically Afrofuturism, I come, you know, I come to this conclusion that there is no optimal future to return, sorry, there is no optimal past to return to. There are only optimal futures to make. So that Palestinians will, Palestinian refugees will never return to a Palestine they knew of 1947. They're returning to something completely new that they have to create. So I ask, I asked the question of what future can Palestinians build, not only for their own sake, but that actually offers Jewish Israelis a better future than Israel is able to offer them. And to help answer that question, I know there's a tension in even asking that, and I, and I have that tension, especially as I presented this book to Palestinians in Palestine, where the situation is getting much worse day by day. So it's a tall order to ask, but I also believe it's an inevitable question that we have to deal with and grapple with. And I, I, I want us, the way that I help think through that question is by asking us to imagine the return of Palestinian refugees not as the culmination of our freedom struggle, but as the beginning of it. As the beginning. Now that refugees have returned, now what? It's our Palestinian futurism. It could be our Palestinian futurism. Um, I don't answer the question, and it's not because I'm hiding it from you. It's because I don't know. 
And if I did know how to answer that question, I probably wouldn't be in the academy. But I am, there are certain places where I'm getting hints and gleaning clues of where that answer may lie. And specifically, I'm looking, I'm thinking about it through an anti-racist struggle. If we think about the Palestinian struggle as an anti-racist struggle and not just a struggle inflected with racial dimensions, how does that unsettle a native settler binary that creates new opportunities for us? So if, am I bad on time? This is your night. Oh. <laughs> well, because I just want to read for you and then hand it over. And I'm so excited about Diala being here because Diala is the advocate doing this work and bringing cases. And so this also, I, I want to, we all need to be challenged with the political and practical relevance of this. Okay, so just this excerpt. Zionist opposition to Palestinian return and belonging is predicated on a zero-sum view. Israel is if Palestinians are not. Palestinians are not if Israel is. Perhaps instead of asking what it will take to overcome Zionist opposition to Palestinian belonging, we should ask what possibilities does the return of Palestinians and the recognition of their belonging create? Palestinian refugees exiled now for seven decades will return to a memory. In the case of several generations, they will return to their grandparents' memory. The journey will by definition be a project of building something new. Returning to Palestine will be literally going back to an unknown future. The overwhelming majority of Palestinians have not demanded Jewish-Israeli removal in that future, only a relinquishment of their desire to rule. Decolonization demands that the settler reimagine himself or herself in this environment. If, as Zionists insist, their settlement in Palestine is a return to that land rather than a conquest of it, then they must acknowledge the Palestinians on that land, on their terms, and in their contexts. Zionists, however, once on that land, have sought to establish a Jewish homeland that is exogenous to the Middle East and closer to, if not, an extension of Europe. Rather than embrace everything indigenous to the Middle East, from language to livelihood and peoples, Zionism rejected them. Israel established itself as the site of ingathering for the Jewish diaspora, a purpose perpetually driving its removal of Palestinian natives. Gabriel Ash, an Israeli-American analyst, points out that the Jewish nationalist uh, population, because of its commitment to colonial domination, suffers from a congenital inability to belong to the land it claims as its homeland. He states that an Israeliness that is at home in the Middle East must be mediated by Palestinians who are always already home. What possibilities become available when Jewish Israelis are made part of the land and the rest of the Middle East rather than forming a satellite state merely located in the Middle East? Thank you. Wow, thank you, Noura. I should just, um, I'm going to give a couple of really short comments, and then I know I can tell from the crowd there are lots of questions here um, about the book, so um, I'll be brief. It's such an honor to be here. Thank you, Catherine, for, um, for having me and for CPS, and Noura for this book, um, and for creating this space for us to be able to reflect on our work and to dream, which is so rarely afforded to us, and for modeling also what it could look like to be a Palestinian, a lawyer, um, and someone who's grappling with all of these questions to which nobody has been able to provide an answer to us. So I'm here in this sort of deep um, kind of moment of, of solidarity and seeing myself and a lot of the questions that you're asking, um, it's, and it's rare to have a, an opportunity to reflect on them and to deepen our work and to talk about it. Um, so I had a similar, a very similar trajectory, deeply alienated in law school, thinking I, I, I was born and raised in Palestine, came to law school thinking I would just kind of get the skills and then go back and figure out how to get free. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm still here. Mm -hmm. I um, have also you know, tried to, to think about this in an academic setting and have also decided at some points to run away and, and really focus on domestic issues. 
um, which you know I was drawn to because of the similarities that I found. Um, I spent like five years working on national security questions, working with Muslim communities in the U.S. and here in New York City who were targeted by law enforcement because I recognized a lot of the legal frameworks that were being used against our clients um, that, that felt very familiar, right? It's almost like military mentality that we use for um, all enemies within, right? The way that Palestinians are viewed by the Israeli occupation, um, which is the environment that I was familiar with, and the way that the NYPD views uh, Muslims living in Queens. Um, obviously, lots of differences there, but also worth thinking a little bit about what draws us to various struggles. Um, in Nura's book, I think you also see some of the creativity and the, um, the struggle that is part and parcel of trying to answer some of these questions. Um, and it is, in a way, a quint quintessentially Palestinian book in that she's wearing so many hats because we struggled to be, we have to be so creative as we think about um, how we engage with our people's fate. Um, so a little bit about the many hats that Nura has worn in this book, and only some, because there are actually plenty more, and, and she's laid them out. Um, but first, it's really worth recognizing how um, the historical framework here is really key, right? We can't understand our present, and also how we can change our present without understanding how we got here, and how the fact that we got here wasn't just a happenstance of history, it was the intentional and deliberate work, the legal work um, that that um, has occurred before us. And the um, deep archival work and the interviews that Nura uh, undertook, and if you look at the footnotes, they're really rich, and she named a few of the people she's met with, but I think I, I really deeply appreciate that part of the book, which is really like leaning back on our history to be able to understand the present. So the first hat is Nura as a historian, with my apologies to Rashid and history departments. Um, I think that it's, it's truly true and how she's also generating, working on generating this sort of living Palestinian archive. And then the other um, characteristic of this book, which uh, I deeply appreciate, is how Nura takes you know, this historical perspective, right, from, Balfour, from the Balfour Declaration to looking at the British Mandate to colonial subjugation to the Palestinian liberation movement's work the push and pull, um, the engagement with the non-aligned movement, um, the Oslo Accords, the Intifada, the second Intifada, through to the present, um, and analyzing it as this push and pull, this sort of tug of war of um, power and the law. And, um, and again, this idea of, of the, the legal work that you know, both Israelis and Palestinians have had to engage in as... Um, We've pushed back against the creation of this sui generis category um, for Palestine. So I think there, uh, Nura engages a lot with um, critical legal scholarship. She roots um, the, the thinking in third world approaches to international law, to um, really not just kind of uh, taking everything as a, as a given. And so here we see Nura as, a, as the critical legal scholar that we've all come to know her as. And then also there's Nura as a teacher, which um, I think is worth noting because we oftentimes don't really think um, as much as we should about how we create the next generation of thinkers, of lawyers, of activists. And I know Nura takes her teaching very seriously. Um, the book is one of the rare occasions where we see our, our own legal analysis and our own historical analysis told by um, ourselves through our own eyes. Um, our, through our own story, through interviews with our greats and our elders. Um, so this tradition of emancipatory knowledge creation is something that um, is, is worth pausing on and acknowledging and appreciating. Again, her footnotes. I really want to make sure that if you're reading the book, you're also turning to the footnotes. There's a lot in there. Um, this is something extremely rare. I myself you know, we all learned law from um, some of the people who were engaged in our very own legal oppression. I had um, Israeli Supreme Court Justice Aaron Barak as a teacher, as a professor. He's the one who was 
Uh, he taught me proportionality, <laughs> right, disproportionately, and, um, and, and, and we were talking about this, you know, the, the, the human rights community at my law school, it was Yale Law School, rolled out the red carpet for Justice Barack, and that was a deeply, um, I mean, oppressive is like a, 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 it doesn't fully capture, you know, that, that experience, but I think it's also something that a lot of other um, particularly minority students, people of color in law school experience. And so the work that we have to create to really unlearn, the, to, to create opportunities for others to unlearn this kind of um, knowledge that, uh, that we spend at least three years, and if we're lucky, only three years of our careers um, as law students thinking through is, 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 a, is, is important work. Then of course, the book is, is as you, you know, wouldn't be surprised, is filled with the trenchant uh, critique of Israeli military legal arguments um, that have been put forward over the decades. Um, and you take them down in a way that we've all come to know you to take them down, uh, trenchantly, smartly, you bring receipts, you um, are Nura the lawyer. And then there's Nura as an organizer, right? So even the book tour in itself, post-publication, right? I don't know if, if you've all followed it or had the opportunity to see, to see some of the sort of book tour moments, but creating the space where we're having these conversations for the first time in many contexts, um, and you know, the openness to simply asking questions and say, I don't know, but here is an idea, and I'm gonna throw it out to you, and please let me know what you think. Um, that act as an organizer and an advocate is on full display and even how you've rolled out your book, which I can imagine there were many different ways in which you could have rolled it out. I had the deep pleasure of being there for, for Nura's Ramallah book talk um, and really felt that that space was, um, that, that, that there was a creation of a space where we, for, you know, it's pretty rare occasion to have in Palestine in light of everything that's going on, even if it's in Ramallah and it's a bubble, and yes, we all get that, um, but is still very much under occupation, and we're, we're all, we've been struggling for a really long time to have, to create uh, an opening for new thinking, um, and the book talk was one of the few times in recent memory that I could think of where there was that excitement, palpable excitement in the room. So um, thank you for that. Um, and then there's, of course, Nura as a mentor to many, and we all, um, we all have experienced that in various ways, but over drinks after the book talks, I was despairing about you know, the various limited legal options available, and here I am now finally in a place where I'm trying to spend a lot of time thinking about um, how to use the law, fully recognizing its limits, um, and, you know, proposing, thinking through some ideas and kind of killing them in, uh, before, as they're nascent, right? Because everything is just so easy to sort of think nothing is going to be successful, and Nura really spending that time to listen and also encourage and say those are also all pretty great ideas, you should do them, go forward. Um, so I wanted to offer much more humbly some of my own thinking around you know, where Nura ends in the book, right? Nura, the, the book goes through this sort of really important historical trajectory which she just laid out um, around how we got here and then offers us this way to think about where we go next. Um, and as for those of us who are trying to think about how to engage in the law in a way we can support that move next, one of the things that is very clear and um, the reason we need to be asking that question is that there currently isn't a uh, robust political vision, right, that can guide us as movement lawyers. Right? If the idea of being a movement lawyer is to take our cues from where the movement is and what is needed, and then try to help create some space, whether it's we're using the law in this kind of guerrilla lawfare way, or whether um, there are more promising opportunities for us to kind of actually gain more concrete victories, um, there, needs to be a, uh, there needs to be more visioning, and there needs to be a political, uh, there needs to be leadership, right? And, and one of the things that, uh, we see and hear over and over again, I know you've, you and I have talked about this, is just the need for, to, to get a refresh in Palestinian leadership, which is also why it's so important for the mentorship and the teaching and the, and the archival work. Um, so I'll just offer what I, where I have landed 
on that in this moment, given the, um, the challenges that we face. Um, and so I think the first one is for a movement lawyer, and I'm doing this because we're in a law school, and I'm assuming a lot of you here are also law students, uh, thinking about you know, where and how might you apply yourself. Um, the first thing is the movement for Palestinian rights in the US and the Palestinian uh, movement in Palestine and elsewhere is under extreme severe attack in multiple ways, right? You all may have heard about this. Um, in the US, anti-boycott legislation is popping up at state and uh, local levels um, across the country. And we're seeing the uh, increase of attacks through various, uh, I don't like using the term lawfare, right? Because it's oftentimes flipped uh, against, against our own people. But you know, it, through, through these uh, lawsuits intended to silence um, activists and uh, students on campuses uh, for, for speaking up in defense of Palestinian rights. And so that, Sent, that attack has created a, a real sort of shrinking space um, and has stifled the room and the opportunity for, uh, for innovative, for, for that important political work that, that we need to be engaging in. And so as a movement lawyer, I think one of the most important things for us to be doing is just that defense work. It's not fun. It's really, um, it's, it's, it's exhausting, it's demoralizing, and it makes, it's frustrating because we feel like it oftentimes requires us to engage in the defense work when we really want to be doing some of the, 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 the challenges that capture like what we really want to be talking about. It doesn't allow us to talk about you know, the, the, the questions back home or, or Palestinian rights, but it's so crucially important. And here I really want to uplift the work of um, other Palestinian lawyers like Dima Khalidi and Palestine Legal who've been doing this work and, and who created institutions that can support um, Palestinian movement in the U.S. As they, as they struggle to create that vision, right? And as they look to other movements to, to build a, uh, a new language um, and a new political uh, leadership. And then the other piece is um, the importance of recognizing the storytelling power of the law, right? And this is present throughout the book, but um, I, uh, my, own, my own thinking around this has, has been to really uh, look for these opportunities for guerrilla lawfare, right? If we're being attacked by lawsuits or, any, or if, if, if um, anyone that dares to speak up about Palestinian rights is faced with, with litigation, is accused of for example, um, anti-Semitism or anti-Jewish discrimination, because that's been one of the main lines of attack and silencing that we've been seeing. Um, I don't know if people know that Ken Marcus is now at the Department of Education. Ken Marcus spent his career going after um, student activists for speaking up on Palestinian rights, and the Trump administration has appointed him to, um, to the Department of Education, where he's supposed to be in charge of protecting students on, on campuses from discrimination and in fact has used that position to go after um, anyone who's dared uh, criticize Israel under the guise by labeling it um, that criticism as anti-Semitic. Um, so, so, that, so, so the, the, the work of pushing back against the um, silencing and the erasure of Palestinians through the courts by telling our own story in whatever opportunity and space we can find is also crucially important. And so just briefly, I'll talk about one example of when we, um, we've done that recently and then also field the floor for all the questions. So I don't know if people have heard about Airbnb, the company, you probably used it. <laughs> Airbnb, um, after significant political organizing, took a decision to, un to remove Israeli settlement properties from its platform on the idea that they should not be involved in the business of occupation, right? It's a pretty basic proposition. It's enshrined in the duty of non-recognition. If you want to think about it like that, it's, it's, a, it's, it's one of the basic asks um, uh, uh, and obligations under a business and human rights framework. Immediately, they were sued by um, a group of settlers represented by Sharat Hadin. Sharat Hadin is a a lawfare organization, an Israeli group that, um, that brings lawsuits to challenge anytime anyone speaks up against Palestinian rights. 
And they use the Fair Housing Act, right? So to your point about speaking of laws that can change uh, meaning in time and space, right? The Fair Housing Act was a core feature of the civil, core victory of the civil rights movement. It's intended to protect, um, protect people from discrimination, uh, mostly uh, black people, um, from housing discrimination. And so to see it being used by these settlers who are on stolen land, um, invoking it as a way to be able to continue their own discrimination was just kind of outrageous and dissonant and also an opportunity, an exciting opportunity, right? Because what's happening in that story? We're having settlers sue Airbnb and there's nobody to talk about the Palestinians, right? Where are the Palestinians? Whose lands are these on? Why did Airbnb even do this? And so, you know, we um, found the Palestinians who live, who own the land that these plaintiffs lived on, um, asked them if they wanted to be our clients and intervened in that lawsuit and raised um, told their stories, told their stories of dispossession. I'm seeing some people in the audience here who really helped us in a lot of that research, so thank you. It was a huge um, undertaking of just factually. And we're able to flip the script, right? You're talking discrimination? No, actually, let's sue you for war crimes. Because, <laughs> and here's why, right? Here's my whole family story. Here are my deeds. Here are the receipts. Um, and so, of course, Airbnb immediately flipped and caved to the pressure because of all the anti-BDS legislation. And so one could tell the story as a story of a failure, but actually I think we all feel, and I certainly our clients felt, that it was a victory because of the pushback that it offered us. And yes, these are small, they're incremental, but it's the space that we're kind of working in right now. So I wanted to um, invite Noura to reflect on other potential opportunities for... Um, for lawyers and activists in the room, and also just cede the floor back to you because that was amazing. So thank you all. So we have 20 minutes. I'm gonna encourage you to turn your mic on, both of you. Nor do you wanna respond quickly to Diala's Remarks? I mean, I, oh, these are t turned way up, so you don't need to be close. And you already know I'm loud. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I learned my public speaking at rallies. <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, feel free to stand up if you want. No, it's okay. I, this is fine. I, I just, I think I want to just emphasize two things about the excellent, you know, remarks. Very humbling remarks. Thanks, Diana. Um, and especially the, the narratives that you're telling us about the other roles that the counterintuitive way that the law can be used, both as a storytelling mechanism as well as what you describe as, you know, the defensive work, that in the absence of a robust political movement, what is the value of law, which is pe what people, you know, are asking a lot because we don't have a political movement. Obviously, it's to, per you know, position us very well in a defensive posture to be able to continue to think through, to develop that political um, vision. But just on the story of Shurat Din and Airbnb, two things to take away from that. One is just, again, to underscore, thank you so much, for underscoring the way that the Fair Housing Act changes, you know, its meaning. But it, for, it was used as a tool in order to force integration, and yet here in this context, it's used as a tool in order to enshrine seg segregation. To be clear, the court never ruled in their favor. They didn't even get there. So, but the but, fact that, yeah, yeah, that they, they are, there. and they could. The fact that they could. Now what the judge does is something else, but this is what, this is what the law, it's indeterminacy affords that opportunity, mm -hmm. right? So again, here it's, it, it could have played a different outcome, whatever the, if, if the political solution had been different. And then second, and here's to emphasize the other thing, and this is drawing on the work of Neve Gordon and Nicola Perugini in The Human Right to Dominate, which is, you know, this idea of what about a human rights human rights law and a human rights narrative on behalf of Palestinians and what they show us in their work is again drawing on the indeterminacy of the law that if we are not careful human rights can be used as a tool of domination and so we here's one example where the settlers are using it to protect segregation but there's multiple examples where settlers are also making arguments that removal, their removal from settlements would be an infringement on their right to be with their family, on their right to home. Um, so they are actually invoking the human rights claims. Why is that important for us to consider? How then do you, how then do you resolve that question? Who's right? 
Is it the settler that says it's a violation of the Fair Housing Act because they cannot list their property on Airbnb like everybody else lists their property? Right? Or is it the Palestinian family who's showing their receipts, their displacement? And, and again, I just want to emphasize that the way that I answer that question is no court is going to resolve that question on their own. That question is going to be resolved externally as a political matter, which is I, it's going to shape the outcome regardless of what the court decides. Regardless of what the court decides. It's what a movement lawyer would turn, term. You, you can change any defeat into some sort of victory. Right? And so here again, the emphasis would be on what is the political work being done? And, I, I, and, and no one asked me this, but I'm, maybe I should just leave it to Q&A and not anticipate your questions. Yeah, yeah, you all want to ask questions? Okay, then I'll stop. And I'll tell you, if you don't ask me this, I'm going to answer it myself later. Okay, I'm ready. Great, thank you. <laughs> all right, I've got a bunch of questions, but I know you do too. So let me take three. Um, to get us started, because we don't have a ton of time here. So, um, uh, yes, you on the floor. You've been suffering on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both so much. Um, my question is specific to um, sort of raising up the, the, the idea of, of this extremely creative um, new framing you're suggesting in the book about imagining the future and around doing away with this uh, colonial settler narrative, which of course is also being manipulated and used in different ways on, on the side of the, the Zionist uh, agenda. What genuinely is your suggestion or your thoughts about, about uniting different forms of Palestinian activism into one movement to create a sort of larger, louder, and, and unified um, narrative, because of course, uh, as I imagine you've experienced, uh, and as you said, there's probably some discomfort and pushback that you just, that you've heard from uh, Palestinian audiences, uh, understandably, around what you're suggesting is really framing. So I'm just curious about that, and also specifically about how gender can potentially play a role in leadership. That was a big add-on. Okay, make a note. <laughs> I know, the gender was like, and then the book. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but thank you. So um, make a note, I'm going to take two more, and okay. then both of you can, yeah. can jump in. Sir, right up front. Um, if you could push the little button on your mic there, I know you didn't have one, but the, everyone okay. can hear you. Um, hello. Um, so I wanted to ask you a question about, you know, current events in Israel and sort of your... Uh, you're talking about how Palestinians are never really effective unless they're challenging the, the system that's responsible for excluding them. Mm. Um, okay. So, you know, we, we can see currently, right, in, uh, in, in Israel, right, the, in the elections, right, we've, um, Benny Gantz has been tapped, <laughs> the second one, most recent one, uh, Benny Gantz has been tapped to form a, a government, right? Yeah, and, um, I saw that, yeah. He's not going to form a government, you know, without the joint list, and the joint list isn't going to join in an Israeli government. Um, so the only option is to sort of have Netanyahu be indicted, the Likud, to uh, abandon him, and then for Blue and White to form a party with the Likud. Uh, in which case, um, Ayman Ode and the joint list are going to be the main opposition party in Israel, which uh, is, you know, a prestigious position and... Um, is not something that has ever happened before in the history of uh, Israel where an Arab party or a majority Arab party is the main opposition. Um, Veer it in the direction of a question. <laughs> right, okay. Uh, so uh, so uh, we, here we have um, Arabs, uh, Palestinians, right, sort of seeking justice, I guess, within the system, right, within the Israeli system. It's happened before, and, you know, in the leveling of the villages that you highlighted in your book, you know, after the high court, you know, ruled in favor. So anyways. Um, so what do I think about that strategy? What do you think about that strategy? Okay. Is it going to be successful? Excellent, you know? Excellent question. <laughs> yes. Zaina. There's a little button right there. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you, Nora, and thanks everyone for your remarks. I have a question about this, this uh, qu issue of Palestinian political rights, and I think 
I'm glad that you mentioned it from 1917, right, right from the get-go, Palestinians have never afforded political rights as a valid um, right in the same way that uh, Israelis were afforded. And I'm curious, particularly today when we talk about, and there's a lot of talk around Palestinian elections, and if the outcome of the election reflected the same ones in 2006, how the international community would deal with it. So I'm not so curious about the way that there's top-down control or reaction to Palestinian rights, but just from your historical understanding and from the, what your research threw up in the book, I'd really love to hear about moments where Palestinians asserted their political rights and got heard, and whether those junctions demonstrated something to us um, as Palestinians in the struggle, um, uh, throw up tactics that we should be elevating over others. So at what points in the last hundred years or so have, pa have assertions of Palestinian political rights really yielded successes from those who uh, are regarding them? All right, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take those and then, yeah, because the gender one's going to be... <laughs> I love it. So um, I think I'm going to answer your questions, Okay. I think I'm going to be, as, I try to be as direct as possible, but you're also inspiring me to think about certain things, so I might not be directly on the head, right? But on, on this idea of the discomfort, I have to be honest, I expected a lot of pushback from um, Palestinian audiences. I didn't get it. I didn't get it. There was such a deep thirst for new ways of thinking beyond what we already know. So many of our uh, core you know, pillars in political thought have become slogans as opposed to political programs. And so because of that stagnation, there was a receptivity and an openness to at least ask new questions. And one of the things, you know, Diala mentioned the Ramallah talk, but also in Jerusalem, also in Haifa, also at Birzit, the audiences were predominantly young, were young are looking for opportunities to become involved, to, you know, to exert themselves and to be a part of struggle. And so there's also, a, what that demonstrated is a vast disconnect between, that's intergenerational, but that's also reflected in the Palestinian official leadership. They have not recruited this new generation. They are not speaking to them. They are not concerned with them. They are not empowering them. In my Assessment, I think that the Palestinian leadership is at a point in their lives where they need to protect their legacy for as long as possible before they admit failure, right? And so that's where, that's where I, I, I saw all of this, really, this excitement and this energy. In terms of unity, however, I want us to de-fetishize the idea of unity. One of the things I hear a lot as an organizer, even here in the United States, is this idea, if we can just get all the Palestinian organizations to get along and be unified, then all of us together will win. Um, we've never really ever been fully unified. There, will always, there has always been fracture between us, fissures and dissonance. That's not the problem. The problem is kind of what Diala was, was highlighting. We are in a position of weakness and have are sustaining a movement notwithstanding these formidable obstacles. 41 out of 50 states have either proposed or are um, passed anti-BDS legislation. Student groups at Fordham had, were banned. SJP was banned at Fordham. They had to then file a lawsuit to become unbanned. Right? Um, teachers are losing their job and their tenure because they, they can't even exercise knowledge production in their classroom. And notwithstanding all of that opposition, we see a movement that has been moving forward so successfully that it has now become part of this new left wave that understands freedom as an inextricable project where indigenous struggle, black freedom, women's rights, queer, you know, queer gender, identity, politics, and the question of Palestine are all intertwined. We saw that on full display. We continue to see it on full display as a battle within the Women's March platform, right? Where the entire question of feminism was basically put on trial to determine whether or not feminism was about, you know, woman, you know, is it a woman's issue and, and you know, a, a kind of a biological understanding of what that meant or, or would it mean? Would it mean a third wave feminism of intersectionality that actually incorporated an anti-colonial, anti-imperial critique? So we can't underestimate 
the tremendous strides that movement has made, notwithstanding the attack, with such limited resources. So I think we're doing pretty good. I think we're doing pretty good. At the point, there will be a turning point we can't anticipate. Look at Chile, look at Lebanon. There are turning points we cannot anticipate, but we can only be prepared for. Our posture can change where this idea of a united front moving forward becomes available. And I think right now, it's, it's, th these are, this is just the reality, but we should be, we could glean from it the positive outcome. What about gender to do with this? I can't answer that question fully, but what I will say is that I also will look to the ground. If you saw, um, one, in the way that we're thinking about this, right, in, in, in the U.S. context of how Palestine has been framed, and the U.S. campaign has this great tote, Right? Palestine is a queer issue, Palestine is an immigrant issue, it's an indigenous issue, it's a, 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 a racial justice struggle. So it's, you know, it's lifting up the, 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 co the entwinement of, of, uh, and the in um, inextricability of, of our freedom struggles. Right? On the ground, though, we're also seeing, I think, some of the most exciting political mobilization happening and being led by women and by queer communities who are insisting that Palestinian nationalism as a framework, as a uniting framework, is insufficient because of the violence that it exerts and it commits against um, our, you know, our queer family as well as, as women. And, and recently the case of, of um, a killing within a, a family. I don't want to call it an honor killing. I think I will just, you know, but that's, that's the idea of, of they basically, a group of women had led and organized a campaign called Talaat that had a mass demonstration where they were asserting there is no Palestinian freedom without women's freedom, right? And so you have, again, and this is where I'm pushing, right? I'm pushing on the limits of nationalism in order to see our future forward. And so, too, our, uh, we see that activism happening on the ground. What about... So I'm going to combine the last two questions that I got. I'm not going to, so the question is a strategic question about what do I think about the joint list and their endorsement of Gantz, uh, of Gantz and the Blue and White Party. And in short, what I'll tell you is that I think, you know, as a tactic, if it's meant to force Blue and White's hand to affirm its commitment to the nation state law and to affirm, right, um, you know, settlement as a, as a constitutional right, uh, Jewish supremacy, uh, self-determination in Palestine just for Jewish people, then they're forcing their hand as a tactic. I think that's great. It's a tactic. It's interesting. If instead this is about a bid to be included within the Israeli project and just to be treated better within it, right, rather than the opposition to it, I think it's, it's short-sighted and I think it's going to be counterproductive because instead they're enshrining the fra uh, national fragmentation between Palestinians, that they are in a place, I think, to actually uphold. That's a source, an untapped source, of uh, a, a great political energy and, and possible new movements forward. Because they live in the greatest proximity and with Jewish Israelis and have an opportunity to speak um, on behalf of futures that we other Palestinians might not have had a chance to imagine or to think through seriously as a practical matter. Um, but you, you are both, so Zin is asking a question about a history of successful moments, right? But that's also tied to something else. What's your name? Hamza. Hamza? Hamza. Hamza is raising. So Hamza is raising, I think, not you know, indirectly is suggesting a question about what happens when we move towards inclusion in a project. And what does that do for us? And there is, a, there is what I describe as exclusionary inclusion. You include a population only to exclude them better. So that's what happens to the Palestinian citizens of Israel. The Palestinian natives become citizens only then to be excluded from the political project through martial law that then becomes incorporated into a civil law framework that police are upholding. Right? It's what John Reynolds describes as repressive inclusion. It's what Samira Asmir critiques um, in her work on juridical humanity, that these colonial projects have included the non-recognized subjects only in order to exclude them under a uh, rule of law framework, 
Page 38. <laughs> <laughs> yes, close read. And so, um, but, so, so obviously I'm critiquing that, right? I'm critique, you can hear my critique of that when I'm critiquing what I describe as a sovereignty trap where the Palestinian official leadership has basically hedged all of its bets on being recognized by the settler sovereign. On being, and that's what, that's what Oslo was, right? That's what the PLO got. They got their juridical recognition from the settler sovereign. But what happens is then now they're in a position where they have to prove their eligibility for independence. And they prove that eligibility. Who determines if they're eligible? The settler sovereign. What, do they, what are they getting in return? Incremental autonomy. They're never getting independence. What do they have to do in order to get that incremental autonomy from the settler sovereign is prove that they can protect Israeli settlers and Israeli military and its infrastructure from Palestinians. So when we see the Palestinian official leadership torture Palestinians in captivity, hand over Palestinians to Israeli detention, coordinate in security to locate fugitive Palestinians in the West Bank, for example, right? We are not seeing what I think would be too easy to dismiss as just, you know, traitors who are lining their pocket. They are pursuing a national project. That's their strategy. If they succeed, they will be recognized as eligible and will be able to exercise their freedom. I think it's a failed project. So again, to overcome that sovereignty trap, we have to look beyond political sovereignty and looking in history. What I'm doing in looking forward is I'm looking at, as I told you, anti-racist struggle, black Palestinian struggle, a site, of seeds of what does that look like. But looking back in history and looking to indigenous scholars like Audra Simpson, who talk about nested sovereignty of the Mohawk Nation on the Canadian and New York you know, borders, we have, and what Glenn Sean Coltart tells us in uh, Red Face, White Masks, we have to recognize ourselves as free already. We have to recognize ourselves as free already and that the aspiration for recognition is actually leading us into a trap. And looking back into the history of Palestinian struggle, the moments that I've been, in other, and historians will be able, much better place to answer this question than me, but the moments that I've recognized as our most successful moments when we've done that is when we've turned away altogether from the project of seeking inclusion. And we've made that recognition, and we've established our own project. So when the Palestinians, who are not given an embryonic government like the other, um, um, the other Area A mandates, right, in the aftermath of the First World War. Palestinians basically are asking, we need our own, we need our own Palestine embryonic government in order to you know, achieve self-rule at some point, and the British never give it to them because they don't want a constitutional government because they know the majority would undermine a Zionist project through vote, through voting. Palestinians don't get it and don't get recognized until they establish it themselves for themselves, without approval or recognition in the court. And, then, and we see, again, when they, when they turn, you know, they go into the Great Revolt thereafter. That's how they establish that right. I see it again very much in the 1970s when Palestinians break all the rules, all of them, in or, and create an alliance with the Third World Movement in order to create new possibilities for the future that European sovereignty has not offered and cannot offer. And that was the moment, moment of, like the closest that you can feel, I anyways, in reading to some sort of radical future. And it's what Edom uh, Gatachu narrates also in the rise and fall of self-determination and looking at black liberation struggles, right, of Anglophone black radical leaders in thinking of how they were going to create an other world possible, not only for national independence, but also an anti-imperialist future where debts are canceled and there's actual parity in the international forum. Now, that freedom dream is appended and is cut short. It's never continued. We never get to the freedom dream. After independence, we get a lot of post-colonial states that have basically eaten up themselves. But that's a freedom dream to be continued. And that's why I think that, you know, looking at black Palestine solidarity might be a place where we're continuing to build that dream. And then, of course, the place where Palestinians, I think, do it again very successfully is when they get off the grid completely in the Intifada in 1987. They take themselves off the grid. It's boycott. They create alternative schools, alternative agriculture, 
alternative systems of sustenance and self-care. And I think that those are really those are really hard, but those are very instructive models. All right. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, will you come back? <laughs> <laughs> I'm pleased that this is your first time here. I'm sorry we haven't had you here before, but we need to have you teach us more oh, thank at you, another Catherine. opportunity. You're too kind. Yes. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you for the